All right, sorry about that, the few seconds of silence. I am working on something, so just bear with me two seconds uh, while we get started here. And um, we can go ahead. Okay, so let me go ahead and share this. And then we're supposed to have a special reader tonight, this evening. So let me go ahead and um, give everybody a few minutes to join us. And then we'll get started and look for... I would play some music, but as you know, YouTube be bugging out when you do that. So I went ahead and shared this information. And hold on one second. All right. Let me, oh, one more thing. Let me pull this up. Thank you for your patience. Let me pull up this link right here. And then we'll go ahead and get started. We have our usuals who usually come in when they see the link. I started it a few minutes early. But um, the link is in the box if you are on Facebook or if you are on if you are on um, YouTube. So let me go ahead and get this thing started again. Greetings and welcome everyone. I pray all is well. Uh, my name is Imuna Yisrael and this is a portion of Solar Namus 101, the Lev Project. And uh, for those who may be new viewers, who are not familiar with the Lev Project, we actually started it on the 1st of January of this year. You know, everybody always complain, Black History Month need to be more than a year, but you know, the power's within our hands. So just to illustrate that fact, we took the power in our hands to begin the Lev Project on the 1st. We started off at that time, and this is all archived, you can see it. We started off on that time with 50 Years in Chains by Charles Ball. We really can, we read it together, and then we discuss how we feel about what we're reading. And it's a very healing and cathartic process, and it has been up until this point. Um, after that, we started the next portion, which was Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl. And again, for those who are new, the floor is open. If you let me know that you're interested in reading, you know, I talk to you, I send you the link, you you come in on this side of the camera, um, in the Google Hangout, and you're able to read along. Uh, so last week we had a reader, Abia, I told him on side, he came in and read. Now we had a few readers sporadically, but basically I've been a reader and I'm okay with that until we get more. Today, we're going to be reading, we actually started with, yesterday we started in a little different, it's a little different. This one, the first two we had, quote unquote, African American black people. I like to do the quotes because we understand that, you know, that's another political term. But we started off with one female narrative and one male narrative. Now, this narrative, it is a relating to the slave trade, but I think it's interesting because this narrative is coming from a European on his observation of the slave trade. So if you missed yesterday's conversation, he was breaking down really how we don't get a lot of the uh, intricacies when we're reading the narrative or thus far, what we get is their personal experience, but he's he's broadening the scope for us. Uh, after he realized the wrongs of his doings, Allen's at the Falcon Bridge, he was one of the ship's surgeon. And so he's really breaking down how they were acquiring these slaves, what the African kings were doing. They were coming on board these ships. They were having these conversations. They were getting paid duties and, and taxes uh, to be able to what they call break trade. So he's giving us a lot of, like I was saying yesterday for the researchers out there, he's giving us a lot of keywords that we can further do our research into. We already know we can't hang everything on one, one account, but what we can do is extract from that account and go back into history and look for these keywords. So he told us about the scramble yesterday and he's gonna tell us what that is but he also talked us about breaking trade, which means where they had agreements with the kings, the Igwe's um, oftentimes in West Africa, what they call them in some countries, Igwe's, and their council to be able to come on board. So if you missed that, you can go ahead and look at that afterwards. I don't see 
our brother in as yet so i'm gonna go ahead and get started and then if he comes in you know i'll i'll, I'll give him the mic we, we usually read more than one chapter so let's start here again you can definitely follow along now this is the treatment of the, the slaves this is the portion that we are on right now and we're going to hear a little bit about how in his estimation this trades the slaves were treated so it says and again like i wanted to reiterate this is written in old english so some of the s's look like f's and so for this reason i might stutter a little bit and slow down it's all good it says as soon as the wretched africans oh and by the way if you're new to this i usually have a little side talk because sometimes it's a little bit too heavy to read straight through so if you hear me go off the tangent a little bit i usually come back pretty soon it says as soon as the wretched africans purchased at the fairs fall into the hands of the black traders let me just rewind a little bit because it's important. Sorry, one more rewind and then I'm done. The fears he spoke about that there were these big fears that they would steal the people and then sell them to the fears. And when the other traders would come, they would go to the fears and this is where they would acquire large amounts of black people. Okay, so as soon as the wretched Africans purchase at the fears fall into the hands of the black traders, they experience an earnest of those dreadful sufferings which are doomed in future to undergo. And there is not the least room to doubt, but that even before they can reach the fears, great numbers perish from cruel usage, want of food, traveling through inhospitable deserts, etc. They are brought from the places where they are purchased to Bani, which uh, we understood that that is a portion of Nigeria, or what it was called at that time, etc. in canoes, at the bottom of which they lie, having their hands tied with a kind of willow twigs and the strict watch is kept over them. Their usage in other respects during the time of the passage, which generally lasts several days, is equally cruel. Their allowance of food is so scanty that it is barely sufficient to support nature. They are, besides much exposed to the violent rains which frequently fall here, being covered only with mats that afford but a slight difference and as there is usually water at the bottom of the canoes from their leaking they are scarcely ever dry nor do these unhappy beings after they become the property of europeans from whom i'm sorry do be putting okay you remember this is a european so he's going to try to absorb himself with guilt but nor do these unhappy beings after they come become the property of europeans from whom as a more civilized people okay more humanity might naturally be expected yeah okay find their situation in the least amended their treatment is no less rigorous the men negroes on being brought aboard the ships are immediately fastened together two by two by handcuffs on their wrists and by iron rivets on their legs. They are then sent down between the decks and placed in an apartment partition off for that purpose. So, uh, okay, I won't side comment. The women likewise are placed in a separate apartment between decks, but without being ironed. And an adjoining room on the same deck is besides appointed for the boys thus are all they placed in different apartments but at the same time they are frequently stowed so close as to admit of no other posture than laying on their sides neither will the height between the decks unless directly under the grating permit them the indulgence of an erect posture he called that an indulgence you couldn't even sit up especially where there are platforms, which is generally the case. These platforms are a kind of shelf, about eight or nine feet in breadth, extending from the side of the ship, sorry, let me go down here, towards, uh, I missed my place, the side of the ship towards the center. They are placed nearly midway between the decks at the distance of two or three feet from each deck. So he's describing the, the bottom of the ship now and really just going into the details of the fact that as we see uh, oftentimes in these slave movies, you really can't move to the left or to the right. You can't sit up. It's a real uncomfortable position. 
Upon these, the Negroes are stowed in the same manner as they are on the deck underneath. In each of the apartments are placed three or four large buckets of a, this part is nasty, so please, if you just ate, bear with me. In each of the apartments are placed three or four large buckets of a conial form being near two feet in diameter at the bottom and only one foot at the top. In the depth about 28 inches to which that when necessary, the Negroes have recourse. If often happens, like if they really got to go to the bathroom often, that those who are placed at a distance from the buckets, like you all the way down there, in endeavoring to get to them, tumble over their companions in consequence of their being shackled. These accidents, although unavoidable, are productive of continual quarrels. Like, I got to go to the bathroom. You keep tripping over me. You naked. You pulling on the person. I'm sorry. In which some of them are always brutified or bruised. Sorry, bruised. There's an F again. In this distressed situation, unable to proceed and prevented from getting to the tubs, they are... What is this? Desist from the, the, oh, they desist from the attempt. So they no longer attempt to go to the bathroom. It says, and as the necessity of nature are not to be repelled, ease themselves as they lie. This becomes the a stench, a stench source of broils and disturbances and tends to render the condition of the poor captive wretches still more uncomfortable. The nuances arising from these circumstances is not unfrequently increased by the tubs being too much, too small for the purpose intended. So you just gave a real small bucket for all those people. And they're being usually emptied but once every day. The rule for doing this, however, varies in different ships according to the attention paid to the health and convenience of the slaves by the captain. So some dudes don't even empty the buckets, he's saying. About eight o'clock in the morning, the Negroes are generally brought upon, upon deck. The irons being examined, a long chain which is locked to a ring bolt fixed in the deck is run through the rings of the shackles of the men and then locked to another ring bolt fixed also in the deck. But this means 50 or 60 and sometimes more are fastened to one chain in order to prevent them from rising or endeavoring to escape. If the weather proves favorable, they are permitted to remain in that function till four or five in the afternoon when they are disengaged from the chain and sent down. The diet of the Negroes while on board consists chiefly of horse beans, boiled to the consistency of pulp, of boiled yams and rice, and sometimes of small quantity of beef or pork. The latter are frequently taken from provisions laid in for the sailors. Uh oh, wait, I went. Where are we? One second, where did, where did it go? For the sailors. So it says here, uh, okay. They, they sometimes make use of a sauce composed of palm oil mixed with flour, water, and pepper, which the sailors call slabber sauce. Yams are the favorite food. This is interesting. Yams are the favorite food of the Igbo or bite Negroes and rice or corn of those from the gold and windward coast, each preferring the produce of their native soil. In their own country, the Negroes in general live on animal food and fish with roots, yam, and Indian corn, the horse beans and rice which, with which they are fed aboard ship are chiefly taken from Europe. The latter indeed is sometimes purchased on the coast being far superior to any other. The Gold Coast Negroes scarcely ever refuse any food that is offered them and they generally eat large quantities of whatever is placed before them than any other species of Negroes, did he call species, whom they likewise excel in strength of body and mind, 
most of the slaves have such an aversion to the horse beans that unless they are narrowly watched when fed upon deck, they will throw them overboard or in each other's faces when they quarrel. I know y'all can see my face today. Usually I don't see my face. So if you see me looking kind of crazy, you understand what it is. Okay. It says they are commonly fed twice a day, about eight o'clock in the morning and four in the afternoon. In most ships, they are only fed with three, with their own food once a day. So the slaves were separated by where they were coming from and certain ones, not slaves, the enslaved, the kidnapped, they would only eat what they were accustomed to eating. Their food is served up to them in tubs about the size of a small water bucket. They are placed around these tubs in companies of 10 to each tub. So they got to eat them out of a trough, out of which they feed themselves with wooden spoons. These they soon lose, and when they are not allowed, others, they feed themselves with their hands. In favorable weather, they are fed upon deck, but in bad weather, their food is given them below. Where all the poop is? Number less quarrels take place among them during their meals, more especially when they are put upon short allowance, which frequently happens in the passage from the coast of Guinea to the West Indy Islands, proves of unusual length. In the cafe, sorry, sorry, it says it looks like cafe. In the in that case, the weak are obliged to be content with a very scanty portion. The allowance of water is about a half a pint each at every meal. It is handed round in a bucket and given to each Negro in a pankin, a pannikin, a small utensil with a straight handle, somewhat familiar to a sauce boat. However, when the ships approach the islands with a favorable breeze, they are no longer restricted. Upon the Negroes refusing to take sustenance, I have, listen up, Upon the Negroes refusing to take sustenance, I have seen coals of fire glowing hot put on a shovel and placed so near their lips as to torch and burn them. So if they refuse to eat, they're gonna burn you with hot coals. And this has been accompanied with threats of forcing them to swallow the coals if they any longer persist in refusing to eat. These means have generally had the desired effect. I have also been credibly informed that a certain captain in the slave trade poured melted lead on such of the Negroes as obstinately refused their food. Exercise, he poured hot lead. For those who just joined us, this is the Lev Project. This is a little bit different uh, form of a narrative. This is the narrative of the this is the narrative of the ship captain who is speaking about his experience. Uh, he's speaking about his experience on the ship as a, now he wasn't a captain, sorry, he is a surgeon. So now he's speaking about all of their tales and the things that they've heard. It's wild so far. Let's continue. Exercise being deemed necessary for the preservation of their health Remember that remember they just stole them from Africa. I just have to do a little. And so they're doing everything they can to to not really because they care about them because I got to sell you. So I got to make sure that you don't die on me. I got to make sure that you somewhat healthy for me to get a return on my investment. So this is why they're going really through all of this and to such measures as wanting to pour hot lead on somebody or put coals to their lips to eat. It says exercise being deemed necessary for the preservation of their health they are sometimes obliged to dance when the weather will permit their coming on deck. If they go about in reluctancy or do not move with agility, they are flogged. A person standing by them all the time with a cat of nine tails in their hand for that purpose. Their music upon these occasions consists of a drum, sometimes with only one head and when that is worn out they do not scrumple to make use of the bottom of the tubs being described the poor wretches are frequently compelled to sing also but when they do so their songs are generally as many naturally may naturally be expected melancholy 
Lamentations of their exile from their native country. The the song, when I read that portion, I thought it was funny. The song by the rivers of Babylon, where we sat down and there we wept. As we and so this part reminded me of them forcing you to sing a song, and of course, the song is gonna be of um a melancholy nature. It says the women are furnished with beads for the purpose of affording them some diversion. But this end is generally defeated by the squabbles which are occasioned in consequence of their stealing them from one from each other. On board some ships, the common sailors are allowed, check it out. I know we've seen a movie like this. I think it was, uh, it was recent, uh, uh, The Book of Negroes. The Book of Negroes goes into this portion about the sailors, again, molesting and raping the women. On board some ships, the common sailors are allowed to have intercourse with such of the black women whose content they can procure, okay? And some of them have been known to take the inconsistency the, or the inconstancy of their paramours so much to heart as they leap overboard and drown themselves. The officers are permitted to indulge their passions among them at pleasure and sometimes are guilty of such brutal excesses as disgrace human nature. What, he really doesn't want to, uh, in layman's terms, you know, you're raping them and pillaging after you have already raped and pillaged. The hardships and inconveniences suffered by the Negroes during the passage are scarcely to be enumerated or conceived. They are far more violently affected by the sea sickness than the Europeans. Again, I'm sorry, he's trying to absorb himself of guilt. How do you know that? And frequently terminates, sorry, it frequently terminates in death, especially among the women. But the exclusion of the fresh air is among the most intolerable. For the purpose of admitting this needful refreshment, most of the ships in the slave trade are provided between the decks with five or six airports on each side of the ship of about six inches in length and four in breadth, in addition to which some ships, but not one in 20, have what they denominate wind sails. But whenever the sea is rough and the rain is heavy, it becomes necessary to shut these and every other conveyance by which the air is admitted. So now you stifle. The fresh air being thus excluded, the Negro's room very soon grow intolerably hot. The confined air rendered noc noxious by the eff effluvia exhaled from their bodies. That's a new one, effluvia, okay. I gotta look that one up. Sorry, I'll be talking to myself. By the effluvia ex exhaled by from their bodies and by being repeatedly breathed, soon produces fevers, fluxes, which generally carries off great numbers of them. During the voyages I made, I was frequently a witness to the fatal effects of this exclusion of the fresh air. I will give one instance as it serves to convey some idea though a very faint one of the sufferings of those unhappy beings who we wantonly, there we go, let's get some confession now, it's good for the soul. So he says, of the sufferings of those un unhappy beings who we wantonly drag from their native country and doomed to perpetual labor and captivity. Some wet and blowing weather have, having occasioned the portholes to be shut and the grating to be covered, fluxes and fevers among the Negroes ensued. While they were in this situation, my profession requiring it, because he's a doctor, I frequently went down among them till at length their apartments became so extremely hot as to be only sufferable for a very short time. But the excessive heat was not the only thing that rendered their situation intolerable. The deck that is the floor of their room was so covered with the blood and mucus which had proceeded from them in consequence of the flux that it resembled a slaughterhouse. It is not in the power of the human imagination to picture to itself a situation more dreadful or disgusting. Numbers of the slaves having fainted, they were carried upon deck where several of them died, and they rest where 
with great difficulty restored. It had nearly proved fatal to me also. The climate was so too warm to admit the wearing of my clothing but a shirt. And when I had pulled off before I went down, and that I had pulled off before I went down, notwithstanding which by only continuing among them for a quarter of an hour, 15 minutes, I was so overcome with the heat, stench, and foul air that I nearly fainted. And it was not without assistance that I could come get upon deck. The consequence was that I soon after fell sick of the same disorder from which I did not recover for several months. He goes on to say, a circumstance of this kind sometimes repeatedly happens in the course of a voyage and often to a greater degree than what has just been described, particularly when the slaves are much crowded, which was not the case at that time, the ship having more than a hundred short of the number she was to have taken in. I wanted to just share a little thing about that for those researchers out there. What I learned, and you probably may know or not, when he says that the number to which she has been taken in, there's a contract called, um, something you could look up, it's called Asento, A-S-I-E-N-T-O, Asento de Negro, D-E, and then Negroes. And this is where these people, himself included, were, um, they were contracted. They had to pay a fee. This is wild. They had to pay a fee um, to be able to trade in slaves. And they they had contracts like in five years, you would deliver 5,000 Negroes. So it was a specific number that when they arrived, they were supposed to have. And this is part of their motive for overpacking the ship because they were indebted to whoever. It's like if you had the license to deliver to Jamaica, only you could deliver those slaves to Jamaica. And so this is where if they were trying to monopolize the islands and Americas as well and South America. So that ascent is the and Cento the Negro. Check that one out. And it makes more sense why he's saying what he's saying that the ship uh, was short on number because when they showed up, they were going to have to account for that. So let me continue. This devastation, great as it was some few years ago, was greatly exceeded on board a Liverpool ship. He says, I shall part particularize the circumstances of it as more glaring instance of an insatiable thirst for gain. Oh, let me rewind. I got to read that one slow. He finally wanted to talk about their issues. He says, I shall particularize the circumstances of it as more glaring instance of an insatiable thirst for gain or of less attention to the lives and happiness, even of the despised and oppressed race of mortals. This fable no yeah the fable inhabitants of africa perhaps was never exceeded though indeed several familiar instances have been known you got an insatiable uh, appetite huh this ship though a small a much smaller ship than that in which the event i have just mentioned happened took on board at bonnie at least at least 500 negroes but according to the information of the black traders from which I received the intelligence immediately after the ship failed, they amounted to near 700 Negroes. So you're supposed to take in five, you took in seven. By purchasing so great a number, the slaves were so crowded that they were even obliged to lie on upon another, one upon another. This occasioned such a mortality among them. Like, dude, you was packed up like how, okay, let me not. But you understand, you see people sitting on each other, lapping the cars because you going up the road and everybody want to get in that one car. Okay, you about to go on a three, uh, you know, on a long voyage in that way. It says, this occasioned such a mortality among them that without meeting with unusual bad weather or having a longer voyage than common, nearly one half of them died before the ship arrived in the West Indies. So you took in 700, what, 350? 350 people died just like that. That the public may be able to form some of idea of the almost incredible small space into which so large a number of Negroes were crammed, the following particulars of the ship are given according to the Liverpool custom, the measure 235 tons. 
Her width across the beam, 25 feet, length between the decks, 92 feet, which was divided into four rooms. Thus, the storeroom in which there were not any Negroes placed was 15 feet. The Negroes room, men's room, about 45 feet. So he's giving you, you can imagine this if you're good with numbers and spatial things. He's saying the men's room was 45 feet. The women's room was 10 feet. And the boys' room was 22 feet. A total of 77 feet that they stuffed 700 people in. Exclusives of the platform before described from eight to nine feet in breadth and equal in length to that of the rooms. It may be worthy of remark that the ships in this trade are usually fitted only to receive only one third woman Negroes or perhaps smaller number with the dimensions of the room allotted for them above giving plainly show but in a greater disproportion. So his testimony and others that I've read often say that they took more men than they did women. It said, one would naturally suppose that an attention to their interest would prompt the owners of the Guinea ships not to suffer the captain to take on board a great number of Negroes than the ship would allow room sufficient for them to lie with ease to themselves, or at least without rubbing against each other. However, that may be a more striking instance than the above of variants completely and deservedly disappointed was surely never displayed, for there is little room to doubt, but that in consequence of expected premium usually allowed in the captains of 61%, sterling on the produce of the Negroes. This vessel was so throng as the occasion was such a heavy loss. They were, being, they were being ridiculously greedy. It says, this place allotted for the sick Negroes under the half deck where they lie on the bare planks. By this means, those who were emancipated frequently had skin and even their flesh entirely rubbed off by the motion of the ship for the prominent parts of the shoulders, elbows, and hips so as to render the bone in whole parts quite bare. And some of them by constantly lying in the blood and mucus that had flowed from those afflicted with the flux and which as before observed is generally so violent as to prevent their being kept clean, have their flesh much sooner rubbed off than those who have only to contend with the mere friction of the ship. For me, it's like he's describing uh, like how the elderly gets cold sores, I mean not cold sores, bed sores, to where because they, they keep them in their feces and they keep them in their excrement, it, it erodes the quality of the skin until it gets down to their very bone. He's saying the sick ones they took on board and the motion of the ship because they were chained, rubbed their skin and their flesh until it got to the rare bone. You know, I'm not gonna go off point. Let me continue because, yeah. <laughs> The excruciating pain which the poor sufferers feel from being obliged to continue in such a dreadful situation frequently for several weeks in case they happen to live so long is not to be conceived or described. Few indeed are ever able to withstand the fatal effects of it. The utmost skill of the surgeon is here ineffectual, like he couldn't do nothing. If Plasters be applied, they are very soon displaced by the friction of the ship. And when bandages are used, the Negroes very soon take them off and appropriate them to other purposes. The surgeon, upon going between decks in the morning to examine the situation of the slaves, frequently finds several dead, and among the men, sometimes a dead and living Negro fastened by their irons together. When this is the case, they are brought upon deck and being laid on the grating, the living Negro is disengaged and the dead one thrown overboard. It may not be improper here to remark that the surgeons employed in the guinea trade are generally driven to engage in so disagreeable and employed by the confined state of their finances 
and exertion of the greatest skill and attention could afford the deceased Negro little relief so long as the cases of their diseases, namely the breathing of putrid atmosphere and wallowing in their own excrement remain. When once the fever and the sentry get to an, any height at sea, a cure is scarcely ever effected. Almost the only means by which the surgeon can render himself useful to the slaves is by seeing that their food is properly cooked and distributed among them. It is true when they arrive near the markets for which they are destined, care is here it now. <laughs> Now, after you done did all of that, he says, it is true that when they arrive near the markets from which they, they are destined, care is taken to polish them for sale by an application of the lunar caustic to such as are afflicted with the yaws. This, however, affords but a temporary relief as the disease most assuredly breaks out whenever the, the patient is put upon a vegetable diet. It has been asserted in favor of the captains in this trade that the six slaves are usually fed from their table. The great number generally ill at a time proves fatally of such assertion. Where even a captain, what is this, disposed to do this, were even a captain disposed to do this, how could he feed half the slaves in the ship from his own table? He asks a question. For it is well known that the more than half are often sick at a time. Two or three perhaps may be fed. The loss of slaves through mortality arising from the causes just mentioned are frequently very considerable. In the voyage lately referred to, not the Liverpool ship before mentioned, 105 out of 380 died in the passage. A proportion seemingly very great, but by no means uncommon. One half, sometimes two thirds, and even beyond that, have been known to perish. Before we left Bonnie River, no less than 15 died of fevers and dysenteries occasioned by their confinement on the windward, craft, windward coast, where slaves are procured more slowly, very few die in proportion to the numbers which die at Bonnie. He goes on to say, Bonnie and Old Calabar, Old and New Calabar, like I said before, for those who just joined us, welcome to the Lev Project. We're reading some real heavy stuff. This chapter is about the treatment of the slaves. If we're gonna discuss this chapter, so if you have anything to say, you can uh, put it on the side of the uh, sidebar of this video. And then after I finish this chapter, I'll hop over there and read it. And then we could proceed like that. Or if you want to come into the conversation and you're online and you want to come into the conversation, just put me a letter and I'll put the, uh, what do you call this here? The, the Google Hangout link, and then you can click right in and then you can speak your comments if you desire to do that as well. It says, Bonnie and at old and new Calabar where they are obtained much faster, the latter being of a more delicate make and habit. So he's talking about different quote unquote stocks, different tribes. You, when they got them from uh, one place, they had a different practice of procuring or getting the slaves than the next. And he's talking about basically, because it's all business for them. So he's talking about the fatality rate of, of, the, of the slaves that they, or the enslaved kidnapped people that they were kidnapping. The havoc made among the seamen engaged in this destructive commerce, I'll read that again. I just like reading twice when he's at least being, you know, <laughs> the havoc made among the seamen engaged in this destructive commerce will be noticed in another part and will be found to make no inconsiderable addition to the unnecessary waste of life just represented. As very few of the Negroes can so far brook the loss of their liberty and the hardships they endure as to bear them with any degree of patience. They are even, sorry, they are ever upon the watch to take advantage of the least negligence in their oppressors. Insurrections are frequently the consequence which are seldom suppressed without much bloodshed. Sometimes these are successful and the whole ship's company is cut off. They catch them slipping and it's on. 
Um, and we see that often in a lot of uh, slave movies, the planning of insurrection. It says here, sometimes these are successful and the whole ship's company is cut off. They are likewise always ready to seize every opportunity for committing some act of desperation to free themselves from their miserable state. And notwithstanding the restraints under which they are laid, they often succeed. While a ship to which I belong lay in Bonnie River one evening, a short time before our departure, a lot of Negroes consisting of about 10 was brought on board when one of them in a favorable moment forced his way through the network of the larboard side of the vessel, jumped overboard and was supposed to have been devoured by the sharks. And we all heard of the sharks if we haven't because of so much bloodshed in the waters over the coast of Africa, the sharks would just follow behind the ships. So he's attesting to the sharks. And I believe this, this account was written in, okay, I don't wanna give you the wrong date. So I'm gonna tell you what account. So it's, I'm gonna tell you when the account is written in um, so we can substantiate some of these facts that we're hearing floating around about slavery. It says, during the time we were there, 15 Negroes belonging to a vessel from Liverpool found means to throw themselves into the river. Very few were saved, and the residue felt a sacrifice to the sharks. A similar instance took place in a French ship while they laid there. Uh, and if you missed yesterday, all of these ships are on board. The picture that he was painting is, you might have a ship from England, you might have a ship from France, you may have a ship from a Dutch ship, and all of them are sitting in the port consecutively, you know, bidding on slaves to get them to fulfill their orders, you know what I'm saying, to fulfill their contracts. So it was really some Wall Street type vibration where everybody is representing their own home team to make sure that they can bring back or trade in their stocks and all this kind of stuff. So it's very, very interesting. It says circumstances of this are very frequent on the coast of Angola at the river Ambris. The following incident happened. During the time of our residing on shore, we erected a tent to shelter ourselves from the weather. After having been there several weeks and being unable to purchase the number of slaves we wanted, through the opposition of another English slave vessel, same thing. We determined to leave the place. The night before our departure, the rent, the tent was struck, which was no sooner perceived by some of the Negro women on board that it was con considered as a prelude to our failing. And about 18 of them, when they were sent between decks, threw themselves into the sea through one of the gun ports. The ship carrying guns between decks, they were all of them, however, expecting, excepting one soon picked up. And that which was missing was not long after taken about a mile from the shore. I once knew a Negro woman too sensible of her woes who pined for a considerable time and was taken ill of fever and dysentery. When declaring it to her determination to die, she refused all food and medical aid and in about a fortnight after expired. On being thrown overboard, her body was instantly torn to pieces by the sharks. The following circumstance also came within my knowledge. A young female Negro falling into a desponding way, it was judged necessary in order to attempt her recovery to send her on shore to the hut of one of the black traders evaluated with the prospect of regaining her liberty by this unsuspected step, she soon recovered her usual cheerfulness. But hearing by accident that it was intended to take her on board the ship again, the poor young creature hanged herself or hung herself. It frequently happens, hold on one second, let me make sure here. Everybody, this chapter is going in. Is some heavy information right here. So let me continue. It frequently happens that the Negroes on being purchased by the Europeans become raving mad. This is page 32. Become raving mad. Wait, 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 wait. And sh Shalom Kaya Baker, Shalom to you as well. It says, um, it frequently happens that the Negroes on being purchased by the Europeans become raving mad and many of them die in that state, particularly the women. They should be mad for the sight of their eyes. While I was on, while I was one day ashore at Bonnie, 
I saw a middle-aged stout woman who had been brought down from a fair the preceding day claim chained to the post of a black trader's door in a state of a furious insanity on board a ship in bonnie river i saw a young negro woman chained to the deck who had lost her senses soon after she was purchased and taken on board in a former voyage on board a ship to which I belong, we were obliged to con confine a female Negro of about 23 years of age on her being a lunatic. She was afterwards sold during one of her lucid intervals. One morning upon examining the place allotted for sick Negroes, I perceived that one of them who was so emancipated as scarcely to be able to walk was missing and was convinced that he must have gone overboard in the night probably to put a more expeditious period to his sufferings. And to conclude on this subject, I could not help being sensibly affected on a former voyage at observing with what apparent eagerness a black woman sees some dirt from off an African yam and put it into her mouth, seeming to rejoice at the opportunity of possessing some of her native earth. From these instances, I think it may be clearly deduced that the, un the unhappy Africans are not bereft of the finer feelings, but have a strong attachment to their native country, together with a just sense of the value of liberty. And the situation of the miserable beings above described more forcibly urge the necessity of abolishing a trade, which is the source of such evils, than the most eloquent harang harangue or persuasive arguments could do. So that is the end of the reading. He's writing this at the time where abolitionist movements are picking up and he wanted to, now that he was, he, like he wanted to kind of redeem his soul in a kind of way. Uh, this man that we're reading, his name is Alan Van Alexander Falkenbridge and you can look it up. So in his attempts to redeem himself or really tried to purge his soul of um, the horrible atrocities that he took part in. It's like he was willing to be a witness. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you know, somebody's in the mob or whatever, they get caught, now they're singing. Like, uh, you know, so he's willing to uh, be a witness to, to, to this. So definitely, for those who have just tuned in, that was the first reading of um, the chapter, The Treatment of the Slaves. If you have anything to add, um, if you would like to join in on the conversation, feel free to let me know. Let me. And um, you can definitely put it on the side of this video if you're watching it or on social media. And then I'll go ahead and continue here as we have one more chapter to read. I mean, that chapter was very, very heavy. You know what I'm saying? The, the, the descriptions are, <sighs> the descriptions are wow, you know, to see somebody. And that's what happens in nursing homes in these days, not necessarily, um, what he's talking about, but we see some of those, like I said earlier, um, those bodily wounds. Okay, let me let me give you, all right, Jassy, I'm gonna give you the link and you can come in and discuss with us uh, what you felt about that chapter just far. So one second, I'm gonna give you the Google Hangout link. And if anybody else would like to come on this side of the camera on the Google Hangout, you're not really shy and you're willing to discuss, I will put the link for you to um, join us and have this conversation. Cause this is just, like I said, you know, one thing about Europeans, they're very detailed. It, it, you know, they're very detailed oftentimes when I'm reading some of their accounts, um, they're very analytically detailed. So it's not like I'm feeling bad for you, but the description, especially of the waste basket that in your chains, you had to go over your brothers and literally, and you know, and poo. It, where you are because it became such a hassle to get to this overflowing cesspool of a bucket that shared the same space as you in this putrid environment that you dwelled in for months. You know, we, we tend to forget these things and it's not that far gone or, or because even after they abolished the slave trade in America um, in 1808, they were still illegally importing slaves. So it wasn't that long ago. Um, and these things help us to remind us for those who are around about us and to the levels that they will go to um, for, for, as he said, for gain. 
So before we continue, let me see here. All right, he's on. You can unmute your mic and you can introduce yourself. Shalom, shalom. Ah, shalom, shalom, brother. How are you? Pretty good, uh, brother JC. Brother JC uh, is in the house. <laughs> <laughs> RBG Hebrews. Okay. You know. What What did you feel about what you just heard? Um, give me one second. No problem. Um, it was pretty. Um, it was pretty standard in a sense of uh, the, the, the uh, cruelty that we endured, but it was more detailed. Um, it was more detailed, and it was coming from a first-hand account, which makes it more valuable. Okay. So we're not, um, you know, when we when we express our grieving our, our grievance about our ancestors being treated that way. We can now say, you know, these reports are aren't coming from African American or a black person. This is coming from a white man that was on a boat. That's what I said. Down there for fifteen <laughs> minutes, you know. Yes. Agreed. And this is why I told everybody when I found this one, I'm like, my good, because this one understand, like you're saying, the value in it. Oftentimes, when we say something, is discounted. But he was at that time a proponent for the abolition of slavery, and like I said, he he implicated himself, but now he wanted to, to a certain degree, exonerate himself. And the details that he gave are like, like you said, very, very valuable. Is there anything else that struck you? Um, uh, with, with the reading? I mean, the same exact things that struck you of how, um, how yet he was being, um, semi remorseful. He was still boasting that uh, he was still boasting that they were better than us. Yes, I saw that. I yeah. saw that. It, it, I agree it, with you on that. Yeah, it, it was like backhanded. The poor wretches, you know. They, although the Europeans are not as savage as this kind of conversation, but I think that uh, just for the value of the details, it's it's um, it's worth reading. You know, um, it's definitely worth reading. This is this is his account. So for those who have just joined us, I want you to stay with us, brother JC, because we're going to go into the sale of the slaves now. And this is his account once the slaves actually reached to the West Indies, where a lot of our people. When we look at slavery, we'd be like, oh, you know, America. And for me, knowing who we are, it's to broaden our scope that no, it wasn't just America. And to get details, oftentimes when you speak about slavery, it's kind of like this ambiguous slavery and everything is broad brushed. And that's farther from the truth. And um, once we get into these narratives, which is the history that is so easy for us to touch in this space and time because there's so many remnants of it for us to get an understanding. And this history is what has most affected us in this day and time. So many people speak about it, but many people also, we don't apply ourselves to understand it. So hopefully, um, and knowing that it hurts, but it's also good to help to heal as well. And so we're gonna read and then we're gonna discuss a little bit more. I thank you so much for joining us. And um, we're gonna go into the sale of slaves right now. So- and I one more? Go ahead, go ahead. I totally agree with you about um, how people brush the slave trade and slavery uh, over with a broad brush. Um, and how they focus really on America. Yes. Instead of, instead of, instead of um, understanding that 95% of the slaves took them from West Africa ended up in what you call Latin America and the Caribbean islands. Correct. Only 5% of us came to America. Uh, and at one point, they were taking slaves from the Caribbean yes. and sending them to America. Correct. Um, um, yeah, so, I mean, the, the, the slave trade, I made a post on Facebook about this a long time ago, but the slave trade is a very, very detailed, complex mm -hmm. history that we have a lot of cliches Yes. Uh, that, that we're pu pushing as truth. The white man came and gave us the Bible. The white man came and, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's all these cliches that they're not really based in any kind of historical truth. It's just based off emotions yes. of us, you know, you know, being mad about what happened to us. Correct. 
I, I, you know, you're going to take me on another subject because I totally agree. Um, even when, when I started this project, brother, and I'm so glad that I have another enthusiast. Yeah, hallelujah. But when I started it, everybody's like, why are you reading that? Why we need to read that? I don't want to read that. I don't want to see that. But yet still, we are the same people speaking about slavery. So it's like, okay, if we don't know the history, then what, 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 what are we referencing? You know, even like you said, in, in a lot of the accounts that I'm reading, the, the European didn't want you to read the Bible. You understand what I'm saying? He didn't want you to go into the book. So I'm like, okay, at what point are you referencing? You understand? At what point? They, they did it in a systematic way. This, is, this wasn't just, oh, let me just jump up. And that's what we were reading in the preceding chapters. It wasn't like, let me run up into Africa. You had to pay. You had to pay homage to the kings of Bonnie, to the different kings and their council. You had to pay before you broke trade in that space. And as you can see, even when we look, when now when we go back and look at these movies, we'll understand what we're seeing. Because oftentimes the pain just clouds our vision and we're not really understanding. But when we see three ships sitting in the water, we understand that just not, that's not representing one country. And everybody is vying for this prime um, product that is coming out of Africa to go and do whatever it is to fulfill their obligation. So I, I definitely agree with that. Yes, you're, you're 100 percent right. 100 percent right. So this stuff is interesting. Once you start, you know, it it, it just it just you I realize like you said, it's so detailed. They, they they were they went in. It's all they were documented. They they knew exactly how much I took in. They knew where they took you from. They knew, even in that what we just read, he said the Ebos, you know, they really didn't like the, that the food that the other ones were. So they obviously knew the differences amongst those um, who they were taking in and which were more likely to survive, which were not, which were sickly, you know, so it, it goes, right. it goes deep. Yes, so we're gonna, so even, um, mm -hmm, go even, ahead. Um, when it came down, when it came down to selecting, like, uh, which which uh ethnic group they would take okay um they they put a they, they put a like a um they put propaganda out or they put information out for slave traders to yes. look out for, for certain groups like the yes. fulani yes um to look out for the uh the priestly tribes like among the Igbo, uh the priestly tribes used to uh put uh markings on their face correct uh to indicate that they were chiefs but um, the the other the other people underneath them, the other Ebos underneath them, caught wind of how they were escaping the slave trade, and they start everybody started slashing the face. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> yeah, so it's, that's a funny story. Wow, there, there, there's a lot, there's a lot, and hopefully we'll continue to to all of those who are listening, because we have some who are, may not be able to lie on the live stream, but they listen afterwards, and I, I find the value in us when we're reading collectively like this, um, to have the conversation as the feelings and the thoughts and the emotions are coming up, because that it's kind of like community healing, you understand? Because we, we did go through it as a community, as a collective. Um, right next to you, as you saw, as you just read, he was saying the dead person would be chained right next to you. I mean, you had to wait for them to release that person from you. This is the person who's literally pooing on your leg, you know. So there's a lot of deep rooted um, issues as well as trauma bonding that happened amongst the slaves. So everybody stick with us. We're going to go ahead and read this, this next portion and then we'll pick up again um, during our next reading. It says the sale of the slaves or sale of the slaves. When the ships arrived in the West Indies, the chief marked for the inhuman merchandise, the same thing we were just saying, he's saying this is where they chiefly uh, brought the slaves to. The slaves were disposed of as I have been observed by different methods. Sometimes the mode of disposal is that of selling them by what is called or termed a scramble. Now listen closely. And the day is soon fixed for their purpose or for that purpose. But previous th there too, the sick or refused slaves of which there are frequently many or usually cover conveyed on shore and sold at a tavern by venue or public auction. These in general are purchased by the Jews, he says, and surgeons. And we understand by this time, European Jews are on the scene there throughout the Caribbean. Uh, uh, many were dispersed um, at this time and many found their ways to the Caribbean islands um, and were very uh, 
active in the slave trade. It says, these are generally uh, uh, purchased by the Jews and surgeons, but chiefly the former. Upon speculation at so low a price as five or six dollars a head. I wonder what the surgeons want them for. Okay. I was informed by a mulatto woman that she purchased a sick slave at Grenada upon speculation for the small sum of one dollar, as the poor wretch was apparently dying of the flux. One dollar. It seldom happens that any who are carried ashore in the emaciated state to which they are generally reduced by that disorder long survive their landing. I once saw 16 conveyed on shore and sold in the foregoing manner, the whole of whom died before I left the, uh, the island, which was, in, was, was within a short time after. Sometimes the captains march their slaves through the town at which they intend to dispose of them and then place them in rows where they are examined and purchased. The mode of selling them by scramble have fallen under my observation. The, the oftenest I shall be more particular in describing it. Being some years ago at one of the islands in the West Indies, <coughs> I was witness to a sale by scramble, <clears throat> sorry, where about 250 Negroes were sold. Upon this occasion, all the Negroes scrambled for bear an equal price, which is agreed upon between the captains and the purchasers before the sale begins. Okay, so they agree upon a price, right? On a day appointed, the Negro were landed and placed together in a large yard belonging to the merchants to whom the ship was confined or consigned, sorry, that S and F thing again. As soon as the hour agreed on arrived, the doors of the yard were suddenly thrown open and in a rush considerable number of purchasers with all the ferocity of brutes some instantly seized such of the Negroes as they could conveniently lay hand or hold on with their hands. Others being prepared with several handkerchiefs tied together, encircled with these as many as they were able, while others by means of rope effect, effected the same purpose. It is scarcely possible to describe the confusion of which this mode of selling is productive. It likewise causes much anonymity among the purchasers who not unfrequently upon these occasions fall out and quarrel with each other. It's like, it's like Black Friday, yeah? And all they just open the doors and everybody rush in to get the sale. <clears throat> It says, the poor astonished Negroes were so much terrified by these proceedings that several of them through fear climbed over the walls of the courtyard and ran wild about the town, but was soon hunted down and retaken. While on a former voyage from Africa to Kingston, Jamaica, I saw a sail there by scramble on board a snow. The Negroes were collected together upon the main and quarter decks and the ships were darkened by sails suspended over them in order to prevent the purchasers from being able to see so as to pick or refuse or choose. It sounds familiar. It sounds like when people go to the meat shop and they put the red light on the jammy. So you don't know it's like 50 day old meat. You understand? So not only are they robbing on one side, they're robbing Europeans who are looking to buy these slaves on the other side too. It says the signal being given, the buyers rushed in as usual to seize their prey. When the Negroes appeared to be extremely terrified and nearly 30 of them jumped into the sea, because this one was on the boat, but they were all soon retaken chiefly by boats from other ships. On board a ship lying at Port Maria in Jamaica, I saw another scramble in which, as usual, the poor Negroes were greatly terrified. The women in particular clanged to each other in agony, scarcely to be conceived, shrieking through ex 
excess of terror at the savage manner in which their brutal purchasers rushed upon and seized them. Though humanity, one should imagine, would dictate the captains to apprise the poor Negroes of the mold by which they were to be sold, and by that means to guard them in some degree against the surprise and terror which must attend it. I never knew that any notice of the scramble was given to them, nor have I any reason to think that it is done, or that this mode of sale is less frequent at this time than formerly. Various are the deceptions made use of in the disposal of the six slaves. Many of these, such as must excite in every human mind the li liveliest sensations of horror, I have seen well informed Sorry, I have been well informed that a Liverpool captain boasted of his having cheated some Jews by the following stratagem. A lot of slaves afflicted with the flux, being about to be landed for sale. Listen to this now. He directed the surgeon to stop the anus of each of them with oakum. Thus prepared, they were landed and taken to the accustomed place of sale where being unable to stand but for a very short time, they were usually permitted to sit. The Jews, when they examined them, obliged them to stand up in order to see if there be any discharge. And when they do not perceive this appearance, they confer it as a symptom of recovery. In the present instance, such appearance being prevented, the bargain was struck and they were accordingly sold but it was not long before a discovery ensued. The excruciating pain which the prevention of discharge of such an acrimonious nature occasioned, not being, to be, sorry, not being to be borne by the poor wretches, the temporary obstruction was removed and the deluded purchasers were speedily convinced of the imposition. So grievously are the Negroes sometimes afflicted with this troublesome and painful disorder that I have seen large numbers of them after being landed, obliged by the virulence of the complaint to stop almost every minute as they passed on. So that was the end of the uh, sale of the Negroes where he spoke of the scrambles. You know, you could just imagine Black Friday, you know what I'm saying? and how crazy the adrenaline is pushing and everybody thinks that they're getting a, uh, some type of, um, you know, everybody thinks that they're getting some type of deal. Imagine you're just running on to people. We have some comments here and then we're gonna hear back from our brother. Let me see if he's still there. Hey brother, you still there? We, I'm gonna read some comments and I'm gonna get your comments because that was a wild chapter. We have my imam is being in the house saying this is evil 100%. We have Chief Judah um, saying shalom, shalom. Yeah, okay, the chapter was deep. And that is a very is a very sad and real present um, issue within our community. The name of the book that we're reading from is An Account of the Slave Trade of West Africa. No, An Account of the Slave Trade on the Coast of Africa. It's, the, um, it's by a man named, I'm gonna write it right here. His name is Alexander. Actually, let me just put, give everybody the link that I'm reading from. And so you could also see why I'm going slow over these S's and F's because it's some kind of old school publishing tactic. But his name is Alexander Falconbridge. And um, that, that's, that's it right there, Chief of Judah. I, I, and that's what I'm reading from. Um, and it's a European who was a surgeon, firsthand account off these ships. And he's telling about his experience, not only in Africa, off the coast of Africa, but he's also telling about what happens when now he goes to. So he's going the whole triangular trade. And he's telling you what happens in detail on each leg of the journey. So, brother, are you still there? I'm still here. All right. The mic is yours. Okay. Um, when he talks about um, how, how they sold defective, defected slaves mm -hmm. um, uh, to the Jews, uh, I found that kind of, uh, kind of interesting. Uh, the method they used to like, stop the diarrhea mm -hmm. they, was, uh, they, were, they were having. Um, because my, the slave narratives are very near and dear to me because my, my great-great-great-grandfather and my great 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 uncle uh both published slave narratives oh wow 
uh, my so you know we're gonna have to read it now. <laughs> hey, you know we're gonna have to read it on the left project. You done did it, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, my my uncle Fountain actually did a voice recording. Oh, that's for for um for the Library of Congress in the 1940s when he was 101. Um, you can you can look it up on on, um, on YouTube. It's like 40 minutes long. You know we're gonna, gonna do that. <laughs> that's beautiful. That's history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. I always say that's my that's my Bible. My ancestors' slave narratives. That's my Bible, my family. But um, and my and my and my great great grandfather's narrative, um, I believe he alluded to the same, the same selling of slaves that were defected or sick or something like that for a lower price. Mm hmm. Only, only to like uh, to uh, to African American slave owners, or or Jewish slave owners, or women. Wow. Wow. For those who just joined us, this is the Left Project. We've been doing it consecutively. That's we have a special guest on. It looked like he's gonna be. He likes the slave narrative, so we're gonna invite him on again um, to just have the conversation because that's really what we want to have. We want to be able to read these collectively, and we also want to be able to have the conversation around it um, because really I'm about healing. And in order for us to heal, you know, everybody asks what's wrong with our people, but you know, as we're reading this, a whole lot is wrong. <laughs> You know, we've been through a whole lot of trauma, a whole lot of issues, and even those who come to the understanding of who we are without understanding that this is in our DNA, this is in our epigenetics, um, this is in our genetics, um, some of these issues. You know, when I'm reading what he's talking about, about being in the hole of the ship, I, myself personally, I don't like a lot of people, you know, sucking up my air. Even since I was young, I'm, I just like have an issue with, like a level of claustrophobia, you know what I'm saying? And not necessarily in tight spaces, but more like too many people in a close quarter. And I always wondered that and my fact that I really don't like, I don't like ships, you understand? And I always say, you know, the last time my ancestors took a, a, a cruise, you know, we ended up on the wrong side of the sea. So that, I, oh, I didn't know where it came from, but the more that I'm reading of these things, you can see how this stuff can get in you. Um, and everybody may have a different tale. Everybody may not have been affected by uh, the same way. But as we're going through this, we can find out what we connect with and begin to hear those portions of us. So, Brother JC, what do you have to say? Um, I totally agree. Um, when you, you do the research, there's a doctor named Dr. Um, Joyce DeGraw. Okay. And she wrote a book called and she's an actual doctor, like she's an actual clinical doctor, um, yeah. you know, and she's, she wrote a book called Post-Dramatic Slave Syndrome. Correct. And she talks about how the different, um, the different conditions and different treatment that we receive is passed down inherently through, uh, from mother to child. Okay. You know, in certain, in certain behaviors, like you said, uh, you get claustrophobic after a while, like you know, you like to have your breathing space. Okay, you know? but then, then we read that. I mean, that situation will make anybody yeah. claustrophobic. <laughs> that's true, and and that's and that's uh and that's kind of uh, the old the old saying that you know black people don't like water. We really don't. No. We really don't. <laughs> I mean, we got a good reason not to. So. Especially with being so many being thrown overboard, so many taking their lives through drowning. We don't know, you know what I'm saying, how that has affected us. There, there's so many studies how the, the, the things that happen to the collective consciousness, it affects us on these levels. And some people say, oh, that's pseudoscience. But really, you know, that's what I have to say. I see Sister uh, Rachel has joined us. You can take your mind off of mute. And definitely introduce yourself and let us know how it is that you um some feedback on on the reading that we just did. Sister Rachel. I see her here, but I don't I see a mic on mute, so you could you can definitely take it off and um come to the mic if you so desire. Let me go ahead and check. And see if we have any other comments here. Okay, not at this time. So, brother, is there anything that you'd like to say after that? We usually do three, four, three, four times a week. Uh, tomorrow is 
if I do do it tomorrow, we're gonna have to do it a little earlier because that session is take time to heal. It's akin to this one, but it's a space where we can come and speak about things that are uh, uh, that are affecting us as a community on an emotional, mental, and spiritual level. Um, and it's just a community conversation. And so usually I don't keep it on those days, but definitely Thursdays I'll be back and just tune into social media, especially Facebook, and I'll post it and others usually repost it so we can know the time for the day. So uh, Sister Rachel, if you're there, the mic is still open to you. And Brother JC, I want to thank you so much for joining us. It's great to have an enthusiast. Also, I have another sister who's been with us from the beginning, Sister Angel, as well as my Ema, Miss B. And they've been with us um, having this conversation. And I'm so glad that more and more people are joining on. Is there anything that you'd like to say before we go? Um, no, I'm, I'm pretty squared off. Um, I'm going to check that, that slave narrative uh, out. So I have an a up-and-coming lecture here in Atlanta. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into some slave narratives that I've found actual first-hand accounts for, from slaves themselves identifying with the children of Israel. And I also got accounts from uh, chaplains, uh, white, uh, um, white evangelists, and, and white uh, people in general that also bear witness to the, um, our enslaved ancestors identifying themselves with the children of Israel. So, so you know, uh, we definitely going to have to link. <laughs> Because this is, this is uh, I'm not sure if you, you came across, I came across one, we're going to read it hopefully coming up, Kwame, The Last Slave of West Africa, I think is the name of the book. Did you come across that one? No, I haven't came across it's it It's a professor, I'm going I'm to I'm I'm pass it on to you. It's a professor coming out of um, Ghana, of Accra, and he is, from his version, he's still on the mainland and giving his account via... Uh, you know the the natives as well as the elders and the oral traditions of the beginnings of what would become like Nigeria the West Coast and he spoke about uh, what he calls Jews and Berbers coming in and migrating into a portion of North Africa and he speaks about the whole migration which I thought was just very very interesting so I'll send over that information because that might be also helpful as well okay please do please do we'll do so once again, I want to thank everybody for tuning in to the Lev Project. My name is Imuna Yisrael, and this is a portion of Solonomics 101. Once again, y'all know I'm not always on camera, but I want to thank everybody. And again, tune in and tell a friend um, as we continue to get some faces and some names on this very elusive topic oftentimes. It's one that is painful, but once we go into it, it can be very healing. So until next time, my name is Imuna Yisrael. I pray everybody have a blessed night and shalom.